Adam, if you are seeing this, can you please come home to your family? They really do miss you. And if anybody knows where Adam is, please contact the Ontario County Sheriff's. So this way, the family can know how he is and that he's okay. This is 31-year-old Rose Chase. As alluded to during this news clip, Rose's husband and high school sweetheart, Adam, had been missing for about six weeks before this video was shot. For most, her strange behavior can be felt within the first few moments, as her eye direction shifts all around the room, seeking affirmation from those surrounding her. And she constantly refers to their family as his family. Or as she put it, your family instead of our family. Can you please come home to your family? She does this again by stating how much they miss him instead of we. They really do miss you. If there is one thing to take note of as we dive deeper into this video, it's that Rose is a horrible liar. Let's now start at the beginning. On June 14, 2012, in a home located at 2215 Mott Road in Ontario County, New York, a 31-year-old man named Adam Chase and his wife Rose both stayed home from work as they needed time to work on their marriage following a very serious disagreement. During that evening, Adam stopped replying to texts and phone calls from his friends and family. His lack of response continues into the following day, and his mother becomes increasingly concerned. Adam's mother then calls Rose and asks if she knows where Adam is. Rose replies, implies that she and Adam had gotten into an argument, which started to get physical. Adam had accused her of cheating on him, and then stormed out of the house on foot. He didn't take his phone, wallet, or vehicle with him, and said to Rose on his way out that she will never see him again. Rose also explained that she had felt that Adam was bluffing, and that he would obviously come back later that evening, since the two have a four-year-old son together named Tristan. Adam's mom, Sylvia, found this narrative quite strange and immediately called the police to report Adam missing. She tells the police that in the week before Adam went missing, she was sent a picture of Rose cheating on Adam with another man. She confronted Rose about this picture, and Rose denied having the affair, stating that the man in the picture was just a friend, a gay friend. When Rose wouldn't own up to it, Sylvia then sent the picture to her son Adam just two days before he went missing, on June 12th. The day after filing the report, on June 16th, 2012, two investigators followed up by visiting the home of Adam and Rose. Rose answered the door, and the two officers briefly interviewed her regarding the argument and Adam's potential whereabouts. Rose tells these officers the same story that she told to Adam's mom, but this time with slightly more information. She now says that Adam had approached her regarding the picture that he was given of Rose cheating with this other man named Mark as the two sat on a bench at a nearby park. Rose confirmed that she was in fact having an affair, and that it was Adam's fault as all he would ever do was play video games and watch TV, neglecting their relationship and not giving her enough attention. During this argument, Adam brought up his concern regarding whether or not their son was biologically his. Rose then told Adam that she was confident that it was not his son, so Adam became enraged, punched a hole in the wall, and stormed out. She repeated that Adam left on foot, he did not bring any belongings with him, and that he said that she would never see him again. Although quite suspicious, investigators chalked this up as no marriage is perfect, and continued on their way. They returned to the house two days later, on June 18th. This time, they brought a cadaver dog with them. They ask Rose if they can search the premises, and Rose reluctantly agreed. They walk through the main floor and the upstairs bedrooms, taking note of how messy and unorganized the home appeared to be. There was a different smell emanating from each room, but the worst smell of all came from the basement. The cadaver dog also seemed to signal that it believed something was downstairs. As they enter the basement, Rose explains that the putrid smell was coming from dead rats that constantly break in, eat rat poison, and die throughout the basement. She also stated that there were several bags of rotting garbage stacked up down there that were definitely contributing to the smell. The officers walk through the basement and do in fact see a massive pile of garbage, as well as several different dead and decomposing rodents. They do not spend long, but they are inclined to believe that Rose's claims regarding regarding the smell are accurate. They then leave and thank Rose for her cooperation. The next day, on June 19, 2012, Adam's mother and father both received the same identical text message from Adam. Chase's sisters say there were two texts on June 19th, one to each of their parents. It said, staying with a friend in Canandaigua need time to think. After receiving these messages, Sylvia immediately places a call to Adam's phone, which is quickly forwarded to voicemail. They both felt that this message was strange and not sent by Adam. Investigators quickly determined that these messages were sent from the city of Canandaigua, but when police responded to the area where the messages came from, 
Adam was nowhere in sight. Over the following five months, search efforts ramped up, and Adam's family continued to contact news stations with the hopes of locating their missing son. Ontario County Sheriff's deputies are asking for your help tonight, finding a missing man. They say 31-year-old Adam Chase went missing on June 14th. Adam, if you can hear this, you have a place to come home to. Call me, email me, whichever. Just come home. That's it. Rose would attend these news interviews and press conferences with the rest of the family. However, she always appeared uninterested or just plain over it. It was also around the time of this particular press conference that Rose stated that the man that she was seen kissing in the photograph was now her new full-time boyfriend. He had even moved into the house where Rose and Adam had lived. This did not go unnoticed, and Adam's family became even more determined to link his disappearance to Rose, as they all felt that she had become distant and was not putting any energy into helping locate him. So in November of 2012, they went on to hire a family friend and private investigator named Rodney G. Miller to help with the case. Rodney's first course of action was to speak directly with Rose, so in mid-November, he visits Rose at home and introduces himself. He asks if she has any information that could possibly help him, and she seems withdrawn while replying that she told investigators everything that she knows. Rodney then asks if he can walk through the house. Rose agrees, and Rodney walks through the entire home also noticing how filthy it really was. In the basement, he also notices the distinct order of decomposition. Rose tells him the exact same story about the dead rats and old garbage. Rodney reluctantly believes her story and then leaves the house. On his way out of the house, he walked past a living room where a TV was turned on. He sees that Rose's boyfriend was relaxing on the couch and watching TV, seemingly very comfortable. Rodney then warns Rose that if Adam were to ever return home to that man living in his house, he won't be very happy, and it could even lead to violence between the two men. Rose then replies that she was done with Adam. She did not want him back even if he did come home. She was sick of him. Rodney found this response quite strange, but continued on his way out of the house. As he returned to his car, he felt certain that Rose was far more involved in Adam's disappearance than she has been saying she is. He contacts Adam's parents and tells them that he's fairly confident that this should not be a missing persons case. Instead, that he believes that a homicide has taken place. Over the following weeks, Rodney hatches a plan. He was determined to corner Rose into admitting that more had happened to Adam than she was leading on. So he locates Rose's usual babysitter named Sandy and asks her to help him out. She agrees, and they discuss the plan. Shortly after speaking with Rodney, Sandy was then contacted by Rose on December 12th, and Rose had asked if Sandy could take her son Tristan for the night. Sandy says no problem, and so Rose drops off her son for the night. She returns the next morning, on December 13th, to pick him up. When she arrives, Sandy tells her that she had heard that the police had made a breakthrough in Adam's case and were planning to make an arrest sometime over the next 48 hours. Apparently, Rose immediately started to shake and her skin turned extremely pale. She then said that she needed to go. As soon as Rose drove off, Sandy called Rodney and told him, This is the time. Go now. So Rodney drove straight to Rose's home and approached her as she was entering the house. He informed her that he had built a strong enough case against her that he believes that she will be charged with murder over the next 48 hours. He says that he may be able to help her as long as she tells him where she buried Adam's body. He also stated that he knows that she had the body in the house based on the way it smelt when he walked through it. Rose replied, I didn't bury it. I burned it. She then explained that Adam's body had been in her basement for several weeks and had heavily decomposed. She then loaded him into the car piece by piece and drove his remains to her mother's property on Haggerty Road in Potter, Yates County. She had actually transported these remains with their four-year-old son in the vehicle. Rodney Miller then immediately contacted the police and informed them of this breakthrough. The police rushed to the Haggerty Road property and located several bones scattered throughout the burn pit. Rose was quickly apprehended and transported back to the Ontario County Police Station, where she took part in an interview. The first thing that investigators wanted to know is where Adam's body was when they walked through the home with the cadaver dog. So when we were in there the, the night that we came over, me and Investigator Durgan, yes. where in the basement was he? <clears throat> the part that I told you the light wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. I had skids along the wall, mm -hmm. and he was <clears throat> underneath all this stuff that was in that corner. Okay. All right. How'd you get in there? I dragged him. By yourself? Mm-hmm. I mean, he's a pretty big guy, and, you know, 
when somebody can't move, it's, it's hard to move them. It was very difficult. Okay. I, I will admit it was difficult. They then ask Rose to explain what actually happened to Adam that caused his death. The day that he called into work, is that when this happened? Yes. Okay. Well, what happened? He, uh, him and I called into work so this way we could work things out. Okay. He went back to sleep after he called up his boss. Okay. I tried waking him up. It took me a while, but he finally got up. He went upstairs to grab a smoke. Then I, he w started to go on the computer, and I go, I thought we were going to talk about this. Started arguing again about mm -hmm. the fact that Mark kissed me. And I go, yes, it was only a kiss. And he goes, well, you told me last night that we're going to get a DNA test done on Tristan. I told him, I told him then, no need, Tristan's not yours. He got furious, punched the wall. Okay, and that was the, that was the hole that we saw, right? I, I went to grab him. He did push me away. I went to grab him again, and I don't know how, if he tried to push me away again or if I tried to grab, and he grabbed him wrong, but he, his foot caught the stairs, and he tumbled down the stairs. I because I remember it was a sunny day, and the light was coming in from the window right there. So I grabbed him. He went to push me away again. That's when his right foot caught the edge of the stairs, and he just tumbled. The biggest problem with Rose's story is that if it really was an accident, all she would have needed to do is call 911 to report the fall, which would have gotten Adam immediate medical attention. Since the remains were already destroyed, there was not enough evidence to determine whether or not Rose's story was even credible. That being said, this statement from Rose is what investigators had to work with in order to gain a conviction against her, be it truthful or not. So they ask her directly why she didn't call the police. I, I guess what I'm having trouble with is if this was him falling down the stairs, why do we go through all this? I mean, what do we go through all this for? I'm just, help me figure this out, because... At first, I thought everyone was going to think it was a murder. Mm -hmm. That I, you know, that I fucked him on purpose. And then when I, after I hid the body, and the dogs came in. I thought I got pretty lucky. I was going to turn myself in several times. Mm -hmm. But the thing that kept shying me away from turning me uh, myself in was how his family acted. Mm -hmm. What do you mean as, by that? As in what they were doing was you know, making, uh, pissing me off. Mm -hmm. How about they were, sh you know, saying that I did all this stuff without physical evidence, and it really pissed mm -hmm. me off, and I just wanted So this drags on mostly because of their treatment of you after this happens? Correct. Is that, okay, all right. Not only is Rose a horrible liar, but she is also deluded while exhibiting symptoms of obsessive compulsive disorder and narcissistic personality disorder. Instead of trying to save her high school sweetheart's life, she became convinced that everyone around her would immediately believe that she was a murderer. So she took every step that she could think of to remain in control of their perception, while having no regard for human life. When Adam's family saw through her lies and began to believe that Rose did in fact murder their son, she acted resentfully and took whatever steps she felt could negate their beliefs. During all of this, one thing that investigators could confirm was that Rose did in fact go to extremes in order to dispose of her husband's body. When you were taking him out of the house, did you cut him up for anything? Did you need any tools or anything? Or? No. Because if you did, where would those be? He just fell apart. Okay. All right. How long had he been there? He'd been there about six to eight weeks. Okay. 
Following this interview, Rose was charged with second-degree murder, tampering with evidence, and endangering the welfare of a child. Throughout her court proceedings, she stuck to her claims that Adam's death had happened as the result of an accident, and that Adam had died when he fell down the first set of stairs. Although she admitted to pushing him down the second set of stairs into the basement, she stated that she was confident he had already died from the first accidental fall before she did so. Rose claims that she then covered his body up with a blue kitty pool and then stacked lumber and several bags of garbage on top of it. Adam's body was still in this position during the initial search while investigators were accompanied by the cadaver dog. Rose's trial began in October of 2013. During the prosecution's opening statement, Ontario County District Attorney R. Michael Tantillo told the jurors that as they hear the evidence and view the video of Rose's interrogation, it will become crystal clear that this was no accident. Instead, it was a crime of passion in which Rose chose not to call for medical assistance. Then she took the steps to cover up his death and dispose of his body. During the defense's opening statement, public defender Leanne Lab urged the jurors to keep an open mind and not jump to any conclusions, proclaiming that what happened to Adam was an accident and Rose made a mistake by believing she could not call for help. She said, there's a big picture. It's not just about Adam Chase. It's about a marriage. It's about a family. And yes, it's about Rose Chase. Whatever that means. The trial lasted two weeks. However, the jury only needed four hours of deliberation before reaching a verdict. The jury actually deliberated a total of only just about four hours or a little bit more than four hours. So that suggests to us that they felt the case was pretty strong and uh, probably moved toward a verdict, to the verdict that they returned pretty quickly. Without Rodney, we wouldn't be here today. Why do you think that? Because he's the one who found him. He never gave up. I'm, I'm, I'm happy she was convicted. We, we worried when some of the testimony was replayed. It, it always puts that lump in your throat that you wonder what they want to look at or what they want to consider. But in, in my heart, I knew God was going to take care of me. He helped me find him. I knew he would take care of me. But, uh, the jury did a good job. And, and Mike Tantillo, for what he was given, I, you, you couldn't ask for a better DA as far as I'm concerned. Obviously, the work of Rodney Miller was fantastic, and I think Sylvia is right. This case may not be have been solved without his doggedness. A lot of that is also due to the Chase family because they are the people that kept the pressure up on Rose Chase and I think uh, set up her state of mind when she actually gave this all up in December. And I don't think that would have happened without the Chase family um, keeping the pressure on the way that they did. After the verdict was read, Rose was given a chance to speak. She said, I could stand here and tell you a heartfelt apology for what happened, but my friends know what's in my heart and that I'm not a bad person. Rose Chase was sentenced to 24 years to life and an additional 1.5 years for endangering a child. The child endangerment conviction was overturned in February of 2018, claiming that it was not based on legally sufficient evidence. Rose Chase, the Ontario County woman convicted of killing, dismembering, and burning her husband's body in 2012, had a misdemeanor conviction reversed last week. Court documents say Chase was not guilty of endangering the welfare of a child. That charge had stemmed from her then four-year-old child riding in the car with her as she transported remains of her late husband from Ontario County to Yates County. Her convictions of second-degree murder and tampering with evidence both stand, and she's currently serving a sentence of 24 years to life. Rose Chase is currently an inmate at the Bedford Hills Correctional Facility, a maximum security prison for women in Westchester County. I, I, I want the public to know it, it just wasn't me. I mean, Jessica, Sylvia, Becky, neighbors, friends, anybody that had something. How did you get to get her to confess? Through, through Sandy Armisen in, in the game. Been a long time coming, yes. Very difficult to get through. But Mr. Tantillo and Mrs. Hines, they did an awesome job, awesome. Call it mother's intuition, but I knew something was definitely wrong. My son always called me when something was up, always. Either me or his dad. My son can rest. <laughs>